Anyway, we are continuing with our uh, study here in the book of Acts. But as I mentioned earlier, maybe in the first couple lessons here, I didn't intend, anticipate going through, at least in detail, the entire, chap the entire book of Acts. I was wanting to kind of load it up a little bit heavier on the front end because that's where a lot of the misunderstanding takes place as people read Acts. And, um, and so we're going to kind of start just keying in on certain things. And so these next three chapters, there is a lot of significant detail there. But I'm basically just going to summarize because all of them have um, basically two things that stand out. And so that's what we're going to deal with today, opposition and boldness. Um, but, and so that's really the theme that we're going to get out of these three chapters. And so we're going to pass over a lot of detail. And it's not that some of it isn't significant. But as, as it relates to how we approach the book of Acts as a whole and our understanding, I don't really think it's necessary that we get into a lot of that detail here today. Um, and then... The next lesson, hopefully, will be a little more detailed with chapter uh, 7, dealing with Stephen, because that will mark the fall of Israel and blaspheming the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, which Christ had warned about as an unforgivable sin. So hopefully we'll deal with that next time. And that's, that's an important issue to understand, because there's so many Christians today who are worried about that unforgivable sin. They don't know what it is. Some people think they've committed it, and they live a life of, of complete despair. And I've heard testimony of, of various people who have felt like that they have committed the unforgivable sin, and there's nothing they can do. And that is completely false. There is no sin that you and I can commit today that is unforgivable. It doesn't matter where you've been in your past or what you've done. Everything is forgivable today in the dispensation of grace through Christ. And so we will hopefully deal with some of that uh, next time <clears throat> we speak. But here we're not even going to spend the time reading through the entirety of these three chapters. I'm going to pick out some passages to deal with. Um, and, and basically as it relates to this issue of opposition to the message of Christ and the issue of boldness, because we're going to see that uh, paramount. First of all, what is the main purpose of the book of Acts? And I've emphasized this a number of times in the past, but so many people come to the book of Acts thinking, uh, okay, now we've, we've already passed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and we've, we've now entered the stage where He's commissioned His apostles to go forth to the world, and so the book of Acts is a picture of how that message spread and how the church should operate. And that's not really accurate. There is some examples of how churches did operate, but that's not the purpose of why the book of Acts was written. The epistles tell us how to function as a church and even as individuals. The book of Acts was not written with that purpose. The book of Acts was written to show Israel's rejection of Christ <clears throat> and their fall from God's plan to bless them. And that's what we're going to deal with some next, next time in Acts chapter 7, how Israel fell. They fell out of favor with God in His plan to use them. And so God had promised, clear back with the covenant given to Abraham, God had promised Abraham and Abraham's seed, which was Israel as a nation, He had promised to bless them and use them to bless the world. And so that was a covenant God had made with Abraham and, and passed on to the nation of Israel. And that's what Peter, we dealt with this last week, Peter had brought up at the end of chapter 3 in the book of Acts. The last two verses, he says, Ye are children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, Israel, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So 
Peter summarizes that covenant promise to Israel. He said, God promised to bless you and then use you to bless the world. That's why we're going to you first. That's what Peter's drawing out right there in those verses. Peter understands the covenant. And so the book of Acts is going to show Israel rejecting their Christ and they're rejecting the blessing that God has sent them. Therefore, they are not usable to bless the entire world. The book of Acts is going to show their rejection first of Peter and that kingdom message and the covenant promises given to Abraham. And then we're going to see as God starts something new with the Apostle Paul, Israel continues to reject the gospel of grace given through the Apostle Paul. That's the, the overarching purpose of the book of Acts. <clears throat> so now as we move through um, even the Acts chapter 4 through uh, perhaps chapter 8, we're going to see that there are a number of Jews who believe. They believe the message of the apostles. But what's going to become more evident is that the heart and soul of the opposition to the apostles is within the Jewish leadership. And in fact, we're going to see starting here in chapter, in, back in chapter 2 and chapter 3, Peter is addressing, like the day of Pentecost, there is thousands of Jews gathered from all the nations of the world to come up to celebrate the feast. Peter addresses them generally. Now, what we see in chapter 4 on, Peter is going to, at least the record of what we are giving for the purpose of the Acts, is going to hone in on the fact that Peter is addressing the leaders. And in fact, there's a, quite a few Jews who believe him, but the heavy opposition is coming from the leadership. And, and I believe that's, that's significant. Because it's the very ones whom God had ordained to be those who gave the law and taught the law, enforced the law, and to be the spiritual authority and the spiritual guides in Israel to draw them near to God. It's those very people God had entrusted with that that were leading the opposition against God. And that was a problem. Um, as, you know, as the leadership goes, as the leaders of a nation go, so goes the nation. Even if it's not the will of the people, sometimes. <clears throat> and so we're going to see that focus here um, in, this, in the next several chapters of Peter uh, uh, to, the, to the leadership of Israel. And so we want to break this down into two things. Israel's opposition to the message of Christ or to Christ Himself, maybe would be a better way to say it. And then the apostles' boldness in the face of that. And so we want to look at that just briefly in these chapters, and then maybe we'll make some application for us today with those same things, with opposition and boldness. <clears throat> now, with uh, Israel's opposition, you know, in... in uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, he had a lot of opposition. But Israel, by and large, was ignorant. That many of them, now I'm not saying all the leaders were ignorant. I'm not saying all of them um, did not know. But by and large, the common people, because they had not been taught properly from the Old Testament Scriptures... They were being misled by their leaders. By and large, a lot of the Jews did not recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Messiah. It wasn't because they had evil intent, necessarily. It was because they were ignorant. They did not know. And Peter brings that out back in chapter 3 of Acts here. In verse 17 of Acts chapter 3, as he's addressing the people, he says, Now, brethren, I wot, in other words, I know, wot is an old word for, for I know or assume, that ye, through ignorance, ye did it, as did also your rulers. Speaking of them crucifying their Lord. He says, you did it ignorantly. Well, we won't spend the time to look at it, but back in the law, God had provision for sins 
that were committed ignorantly. They were dealt differently than those. So murder is the main thing. If, if you go back in the law and there's a premeditated murder, that man was to be killed. Without exception. Whoever was involved in premeditated murder was to be immediately killed without exception. And it's, it very clearly states they are not to be let off for any reason. But if they were done ignorantly, if it was done ignorantly or unknowingly or unintentionally, there were provisions for that person to escape to a city of refuge because they did not necessarily premeditate and intend to kill someone. And one would be as if a thief broke into your house and in the midst of that fearful time you killed the person, even though you might have committed murder, you were able to flee to the city of refuge and no one could harm you. And so God made provision for that. And so Israel in crucifying their Messiah, they may be without excuse, but God didn't hold them to the same level as a premeditated murder. In fact, Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that prayer was answered. That's why here in the book of Acts, God is still giving Israel, as His chosen people, a, a time and opportunity for repentance. The door has not been shut on them yet. And so Peter's well aware of that in bringing all this out. But now, we're going to see in these next few chapters, Israel is no longer ignorant. They no longer have any recourse to fall back on in their, in their standing before God. They have no recourse, no excuse against accepting Christ. It's now or never. And so what they could claim as ignorant in Jesus' earthly ministry, they cannot now with this ministry going on with the Holy Spirit. And so now we see that not only do they know the truth now, it just creates more opposition and more hatred within them. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, chapter 4 here. And we'll read the first uh, 11 verses. <clears throat> and as they spake, this is the apostles, speaking unto the people. Now, back in chapter 3, you just healed this lame man that had been lame for above 40 years. And it created a big stir. A lot of people hearing about it and, and wondering what's going on. So now, as the apostles speak unto the people, and the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So notice it's the, it's the leaders, the religious and political and authoritative leaders in Jerusalem coming to them, being grieved that the apostles taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid their hands on them and put them in the hold, or the basically a jail, unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So we see, even in spite of the opposition of the leaders, there are Jews continuing to believe. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes... Now notice that Luke, in writing the book of Acts, includes this detail for us to get. He's singling out these people now. It's, it's the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. Now this is all the, the spiritual authority in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they had set the apostles in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So Peter immediately addresses you rulers, 
You leaders in Israel, we're talking to you. And lose verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the, cor of the corner. So Peter is very bold. He's, he indicts them. He's like, you leaders in Israel, you are the builders. You are building this structure for God regarding the nation of Israel. You priests, uh, elders, the, the Sanhedrin they're going to be dealt with here, the council, the Levites, the lawyers, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's saying, you guys, you are the builders here in Israel. And you have set it not the chief or the head of the corner. Verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught or set aside as your building. And, and back in the day, they would have a chief, they would build over there in Jerusalem, they have a lot of stone, a lot of rock. So they would build stone houses, stone structures. And they would begin with a cornerstone. It would be a large, perhaps the largest stone in the building. And they would start with a square block of stone. And they wanted it to be cut exact and square. And they would set that for their main cornerstone. And they would measure, they would take all their measurements and take everything square off of that stone. So the entire structure was built on the, the good starting point of that chief cornerstone. There would be maybe four corners, but that was the chief cornerstone. And that's how they would build the structure. And Peter's telling him, Christ is that chief cornerstone. He's what everything should be started with and measured off of, and you're setting him at naught. You're setting him aside. <clears throat> and that's a problem. And now the leaders are not ignorant. If we jump down to verse 14... <clears throat> and beholding the man which was healed, so that's the impotent man that was healed back in chapter 3, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So the leaders here, they, they know that this man has been healed. They know who this guy is. He's been outside the temple every day for perhaps many years, seeking whatever gifts he could get. The leaders in Israel know this guy. They've passed by him for years. And they know he's been healed, so they can say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? In other words, the, these leaders here now said, What can we do to these apostles? We've got to stop this. For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. You see what the, the leaders, as they conferred among themselves, they've admitted that they cannot deny what's going on. They are not ignorant. They know that this is of the Lord. This is only done by the power of God. They know that. They are not ignorant. They know what's going on and they don't like it. It only builds the hatred and the opposition within them because their heart is set against God. <clears throat> now, if we drop down to uh, chapter 5 and look at verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So what we see here is that the word is getting out. And so now we got cities outside of Jerusalem, round about, that are hearing about the apostles and what's taken place. And they're coming in because they want to hear this message. They want to be healed. They want to see what's going on with the apostles. But verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Indignation is like wrath. I mean, it is like intense hatred and anger. So these leaders, as they see that more and more Jews 
are believing, it doesn't soften their hearts and, and make them think, hmm, maybe there's something going on here we need to pay attention to. No. They are, they are filled with pride in their position, and, and this only hardens their heart as they see what's going on. In verse 18, And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And so we see that, that as the message goes out, the opposition of the leaders only increases. <clears throat> now look about, down to verse 34. <clears throat> In chapter 5, verse 34. Then there stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law and had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put forth or put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, he's saying, let's, let's just go easy here a little bit. Let's back off of these apostles. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up uh, Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him and were scattered and brought to naught, or brought to nothing. And after this, a man rose up, Judas of Galilee, in the days of taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught or nothing. But if it be of God... Ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye, ye be found even to fight against God. Well, that sounds like wise counsel, doesn't it? That sounds like wise counsel. He's saying back off because we've had examples of this kind of thing in the past where there's a new group rise up, somebody thinking they're, they're a, an important person and drawing off uh, uh, people to follow them. He's like, if that's what's happening, he said, this is all going to come to nothing anyway. But he says, if this is truly of God, then you can't resist it because it, you can't fight against God. That sounds like good counsel. But look what the apostles do. I mean, not the apostles. Look what the leadership does. Verse 40. And to him they agreed. In other words, they could see immediately that was good counsel. But what do they do? When they had called the apostles and they had beaten them. So they don't back off, do they? They beat them. And they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. So they're kind of, they're kind of listening in that they let him go, but they cannot hold, refrain themselves from punishing them severely and to try to scare them into silence. <clears throat> now, we're going to look in a little bit later here that, that they're, they're going to go right back into bringing them up, putting them in prison, and beating them and hurting them again. Because their hatred is so intense. Now these leaders in Israel actually hate God. Now think about that. These are the people, these are the people that God had entrusted to teach the law, the law of God to the people. These are the people who had spiritual authority over his nation, a covenant people. A covenant a nation that God had, had spent years, hundreds and hundreds of years of supernaturally intervening and showing himself for who he is and dealing with them and setting them up and elevating them above other nations. And it's this spiritual leadership within Israel who hate God. And I'm sure the average Jew would not have thought of that. The average Jew looked to them, even though they knew that maybe there's some corruption there, maybe, the, maybe you might have had a lot of Jews that trusted the Bible, knew a fair amount about it, and knew that the leadership was not 100% lined up. But I question how many of them actually would have understood the bold statement 
that these people hate God. Jesus knew it. And he pointed it out back in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> Their hatred for God is so intense that they cannot refrain from persecuting the followers of Christ and the apostles. <clears throat> And Jesus knew full well what their heart was like. In John chapter 15, verse 18, he's, he's, this is just before his death on the cross. He has his apostles with him, his disciples, and he's giving them instructions on how to function, how to think, how to understand some important issues before he dies. And we're kind of breaking in here. Verse 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. <clears throat> Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If you have... If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. You see, Jesus was being persecuted by the leaders in Israel. And he's saying, if they have hated me, they will hate you also. And we see that playing out in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4 and 5, the leaders hate the apostles. Let's continue on. Verse 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they have not known him that sent me. In other words, they have not known the Father. These people that are hating me have not known the Father. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. In other words... Verse 22, I, make it, I would take it as they would have a way to plead ignorance if I had not come. A lot of people, a lot of the Jews could plead ignorance if I had not come. Because there's just a lot of things they didn't know. They didn't understand and they weren't being taught well by their leaders, by the priest who were to read the law in the hearing of the people every Sabbath. And he said, but now they have no cloak a cloak is like a big, loose outer garment that they would wear in that day, and it would hide a weapon. Or you could hide a lot of things under a cloak. And so someone who was trying to uh, rob or steal or hurt someone or threaten someone, they could hide a sword under a cloak and no one would know. And he's saying they did have a way to hide that. Now they have no way to hide it. Because I am exposing them for who they are. Because all through Israel's history, the leaders never let on that they hated God. They may not have even completely understood that they hated God, the Father. No, they were trying to honor Him, and they had the law, and they taught the law. And, and they, they gave all this appearance of honoring the law. And being the spiritual leaders in Israel. But when Christ comes on the scene and as He teaches them and exposes what the law really is about, they hate Him because they never loved the Father. Verse 23. And so now they have no cloak. They cannot hide who they really are. He's, Christ is exposing who these priests are so that they can see it for themselves and all the people can see it also. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. Or in other words, their sin wouldn't be manifest. It wouldn't be that they would be sinless, but they wouldn't have this manifest hatred. The sin being dealt with here is hatred for the father. He says they would not have had that sin manifest of their hatred for the father. But now... Have they both seen and hated both me and my father? 
But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So Jesus is exposing the fact that the Jewish leadership hates him. Not only him, but they hate the father. They hate the one who had given them the law. They hate the one who was the author of the religion that they were practicing. But they had twisted and distorted that religion to the point where they actually were not worshiping the true God. They actually hated the true God. They were worshiping something that they had concocted in their own mind. We'll deal with that a little bit more later. <clears throat> as we, we think about the opposition in our day. The fact that when people hate God, it's because they have failed to take Him as the God of the Bible and they've concocted who they want Him to be in their own mind. And that's who they worship, not the God of the Bible. Jesus came on the scene showing who the, real, the true Father was. And it didn't match up to the father that these Jewish leaders had concocted in their own mind. And so they hated Christ because he didn't fit their idea of a Messiah. It didn't matter if it fit the scripture. He didn't fit their concept. Now, in the light of all that opposition, let's look at the apostles' boldness. Back in the book of Acts, again, Acts chapter 4. We read this passage, but um, or some of these verses... But instead of focusing on the rejection of the Jewish leadership, let's look at the apostles' response. Acts chapter 4, verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, set the apostles in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Now notice Peter's response. Peter's just been in and out of jail. He's, he's, he knows that there's heavy opposition coming. And he doesn't hold back. Peter doesn't stand there and say, well, didn't intend to offend anyone. And just, just sharing what I know and what I believe. And I'm sorry to offend you. And, you know, I'm not really trying to cause an uproar. But this is just my personal beliefs. And Peter didn't do that at all. He didn't have any sort of backtracking, soft backpedaling, uh, you know, just slow down. He was right in their face. If they're going to bring the opposition to him, he's going to stand firm. Now, this isn't going out and being antagonistic and trying to drum up opposition. This is the opposition has already come. He is being threatened. He is being persecuted. And he's saying, this is what's going on. And look what he says. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers. It's like he's pointing the finger. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed to the impotent man by what means he has made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. And this is the stone which is set of not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given by men, whereby we must be saved. Peter is very clear. He is very emphatic, and he doesn't back down one inch. He tells them where the blame lays, who's at fault, and what the truth is about Jesus Christ. And now the next verse. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And so we see that that is an interesting little passage to reaffirm to us that in the face of opposition, the, as the opposition grew, the boldness of the apostles grew along with it. <clears throat> now look over in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 27. Now we're, we're passing over a little bit here. Um, 
It gives an account at the end of chapter 4 about, again, more people selling their goods and bringing the money to the apostles' feet. And then the early part of Acts chapter 5 is Ananias and Sapphira, who have a, a property. Perhaps it, it was worth a lot of money, perhaps. There is obviously some significance there. They sell it, and, and maybe they sell it for $100,000, and they come to the apostles with $40,000 and say, See, we've sold this land, and... Um, and here's the $40,000 from this land. Wanting to look like everyone else that they're give, making this great sacrifice when they had secretly kept back some of the money for themselves. Well, Peter s says, you're lying and you're going to fall down dead. And they do. And the whole point with that is, uh, th there's several things going on there. But for one, you and I are not called upon to give up our job and our occupation and all our investments and our retirement accounts and everything and bring it to a church to fund the church. That is not an example of how we're to operate today. This was a temporary arrangement to get them through the tribulation period, which is right around the corner. And so we dealt with that um, either last or, or maybe two times ago in a lesson about them selling their possessions. <clears throat> but... The other point with that is that the Holy Ghost, through the apostles, is not going to allow believers and, and those into the little flock that aren't true believers. They, the apostles equipped with the Holy Ghost have the supernatural power to discern who is real and who is fake. And Ananias and Sapphira were fake. And Peter calls them out on it. And it is an example. It's not meaning that everybody from here on out is going to die because they tell a lie. But these were set forth as an example as you cannot fool us. The time has come for Israel. It's now or never. And there is no messing around with God anymore. You're going to be called out on everything. The, the deadline is coming. As we work through the progression of Israel's timeline... They're not even thinking about the dispensation of grace and the ministry of Apostle Paul that we have today. They're not thinking about that. They're unaware of that. As they progress through their timeline, and they've, they've got Jesus' earthly ministry, His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and now Peter in the book of Acts, they are right on the threshold of the seven-year tribulation and the 70th week of Daniel, right according to promise. And they have to endure that to get into the kingdom when Christ will return. That's what the apostles are focused on. That's what the Holy Spirit is focused on. And it's, the message is clear. Israel, your time is running out. It's now or never. And we're not messing around. And the Holy Spirit isn't messing around. If you're going to try lying and, and getting in part of this little flock to sneak into the kingdom, it's not going to work. You've got to have a genuine faith in the resurrected Lord as the promised Messiah to Israel. <clears throat> Now, in, verse, uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 27. So that was the kind of the first part of chapter 5. So we're breaking in here a little later. It says, when they had brought them, uh, that's, that's the apostles again, once again, and set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, by the way, that, that right there is a ridiculous statement. These are the same leaders who back, this has really only been a matter of months prior to this that they crucified. You know, we're Acts chapter 5, but timing-wise, we're only a matter of months removed from the crucifixion. Maybe a year at the most, but probably less. These are the same leaders that back, if you go back to Matthew chapter 27, they are the same ones that demanded his crucifixion. And, they, and Pilate says, shall I, dem, uh, shall I release unto you Barabbas or, or the king of the Jews? And they say, Barabbas. And he says, well, I have no, I've found no fault in this. This man is an innocent man, this Jesus. They said, crucify him and his blood be upon us and our children. They had demanded that Jesus' blood be upon them. They were accepting responsibility for the murder of Christ. 
because they hated him so bad. And now they're afraid and they're accusing the apostles of bringing the guilt. When they say the blood be upon us, that's the guilt of, of the person's life. They're afraid that the apostles are going to charge them with the guilt of crucifying Christ. That is a ridiculous statement. But hatred makes people a little bit insane. And they are motivated and driven by hatred to where they are losing common sense. Verse 29 of Acts chapter 5. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now that's a good statement. Do you see that that's when, when Peter has boldness? And this isn't the first time he mentioned it. He asked the question uh, earlier um, when he's dealing with them. He says, uh, Peter and John asked them, he says, uh, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge you. So Peter asked that question back, he said, back in chapter, it was chapter 4, I think, when he was on trial. He said, well, you, you guys determine. Would it be more proper for us to obey God or obey you? Because obviously they're not the same thing. Well, Peter, here Peter answers the question that he asked them at their previous meeting. And here his answer is, we ought to obey God rather than men. <clears throat> the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So now jump down to uh, verse 40. <clears throat> they don't like that message. Now the Gamaliel counsels them to let them go, to back off. They can't hardly help themselves. They do let them go, but only after they've beaten them and threatened them and warned them again. And now verse 40, as they agreed uh, with Gamaliel, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to sh suffer shame for his name. And I like that little statement. Shame for his name. I remember reading that years ago and it stuck with me. As you think about opposition and those who op oppose the message of Christ... Remember here that Peter and John and the other apostles, they rejoiced to be counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. If they were going to be associated with Christ, and they were going to be suffering because of their association with the name of Christ, they could rejoice in that. They were rejoicing to suffer shame for His name. Now, let's think about our situation today. So that's, that's kind of a summary of these three chapters, or at least portions of these three chapters, of, of dealing with opposition, how the apostles dealt with opposition, and how the apostles were very bold. Now let's think about it for us today. <clears throat> What causes people who claim to know God and read the scriptures to actively oppose the truth? <clears throat> That's exactly what was going on with Jesus and then later here in the book of Acts with the apostles. It was people who proclaimed to know God, people who were very familiar with the scriptures, People who had spiritual insight and spiritual authority and, and uh, prominence and various things. They proclaimed all this, yet they were actively opposing God. And actively opposing His message, His truth. Well, do we have any of that today? Do we have people today who proclaim to know God, 
who proclaim to know Jesus read the Scripture, study the Bible, and yet actively oppose the truth. And actively oppose who Christ really is. <clears throat> well, certainly we do. You know, really, there's in Ecclesiastes it says there's nothing new under the sun. And it's speaking of the, the vanity of life and the, and the vanity of men. The human race is full of vain people seeking glory in this life only. And, and, that's, and that's really a common problem. And so we are still dealing, there's nothing new under the sun, it says then. We are still dealing with the same issues today. Now, it might look a little different because there's definitely you know, unique things that we deal with in, in 2021 versus uh, 34 a AD or 500 BC, you know, things, details have changed, but people are the same. People are the same. And so we deal with this today too. So the, the number one issue with opposition today is when you face opposition, it's because someone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. They might claim to be a Bible student. They might claim to be a Christian. They might claim to be a Jesus follower. But if they are actively opposing the truth and they are persecuting those who are standing for the truth, it's because they do not love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that does not mean that I can't have... In fact, I've got a, a, several people in mind. One in particular, a, a brother in the Lord who I respect deeply. And he loves the Lord. And he is, he is a man of complete integrity, as far as I can tell. And I haven't been with him, but we, we've been with him in their family a, a number of times in the past. And I respect him deeply. Now, when it comes to the dispensational understanding of the Bible and our eternal purpose in God's, in God's view, He and I differ greatly. But when it comes to understanding who Christ is and what Christ has done and the finished work of the cross and what it takes to be saved, he and I are exactly on the same page. And so there is no animosity there. He is not antagonistic to me, nor I to him, because we have different views on some of the other things. I'm not talking about the fact that people do not love Christ because there are some secondary doctrines that they do not agree with you on. I'm saying when they op oppose, when they are willing to persecute you for what you believe, that's an indication they do not love Christ. A true Christ, a true lover. Now, I'm, you could actually probably be saved and fall into error and go down that road and persecute and oppose other people. I would say theoretically that's possible. But you're doing that because you're leaving the love of Christ. Those of us who love Christ would never persecute other people for their beliefs. Now we might stand up for the truth. We might challenge what they believe, but we would do it in love, not in hate or anger or opposition or persecution. So when someone is persecuting, when someone is getting uh, full of anger and, and becoming very enraged, that's an opposition, or that is an indication that they do not love Christ. And when it's over core doctrines about who God is, about the finished work of Christ, that's an indication that they do not love Christ. That indicates that they only love the concept that they have of who they think Christ should be. Now that is a common problem within religious Christianity. Christianity. 
So much of religious Christianity has developed their own idea of who they think Christ should be, and they actually oppose the Christ of the Bible. And, and in fact, that's brought out, in, look in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, Paul deals with this. Chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> in verse 1. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll start ver verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through the, his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul is worried about how we think. He's saying understanding who Christ is and what he has accomplished is simple. It is easy. The, message, the gospel of the grace of God is not difficult to understand. It's not difficult to believe. And he's saying you need to stick with that. Don't be corrupted from that simplicity. Don't, don't get caught up in all this complexity of, of, of things about... Uh, and we could go into example... I, but let's read on first. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. In other words, if, if it's something that you have not received from us, if it's a different gospel and a different spirit and a different Jesus, that then what you have learned from us, Apostle Paul is speaking of him and his own authority in the gospel. He's saying, don't go for it. That is a corruption from the simplicity of who Christ is. That is another Jesus. Today, we have, and for the last 2,000 years, thousands if not millions of people who worship another Jesus. And it's common. It's, it, it could be, you know, there, there are those who place themselves within the umbrella of, of Christianity, who deny the deity of Christ. That's a problem. They don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. They only love and worship the concept of their imagination. It is absolutely foundational and essential that you accept the fact that Jesus as a man was also God and the Son of God. <clears throat> Now, there's those within Christianity, and this is very common, that deny the finished work of the cross, as it's explained by the Apostle Paul. They say, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus was a, a sacrifice, he was a lamb, like an Old Testament lamb, and so, so that gives him the power to forgive sins, and, and you come to him, and yeah, your slate is wiped clean, but it's up to you now on how you finish out your life. God gives you a new beginning and a new start. And from now on, salvation is on you. That denies the finished work of the cross. People who worship a Christ that they think only is dealing with their past sins and doesn't eternally give them eternal life and doesn't think that Christ dealt with all their sins on the cross... They are denying the reality of the Jesus of the Bible. They are preaching another Jesus. That's a problem. We deal with that today. So your best defense against that kind of deception and that kind of opposition is to love the Lord. To love the Jesus of the Bible. And to be committed to the Lord's will and not your own. And that's where, because when we study the Bible, instead of injecting my imagination, what I think, and, and, and reading that into Scripture, we need to go to Scripture and let it inform me of who God is. And inform me of who Jesus is. And then I'm going to worship that person. I'm going to worship that God. Because this is the source of truth, not my mind. Not my imagination. Not what I want. And so we can uh, find a little tidbit on that in John chapter 7. On how do we know, how do we determine 
what's right and what's wrong? How do we know what's according to Scripture? Sometimes, you know, Scripture can be a little bit confusing. Um, and so we struggle with some of these things sometimes. But there is a heart issue and an attitude issue that is important for us to have if we're going to discern truth. And I believe Jesus lays that out here in John chapter 7. And He's dealing with His apostles, but the same principle applies to us today that He says here. Verse 17, John, or verse 16, John chapter 7, verse 16. They're struggling with some of the things Jesus is teaching. They're struggling with His doctrine. Jesus recognizes that, so He's going to give them a tool to, to be able to discern right doctrine from wrong doctrine. Look what he says, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. In other words, what I'm teaching is not just me. It's not me coming up with something new. It's all in line with the Father. It's all in line with what you've learned in the Old Testament. Because it's, it's originating from the same source. What I'm teaching you is originating from the same source as all the scripture that you possess. Verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, I used to be confused with that verse. Because it looks like it's saying, Jesus is saying, if you want to know the doctrine, you just need to go out and do the Lord's will. And then you'll understand the doctrine. But you think about, well, the Lord's will is a doctrine. So how do I know that doctrine? How do I know the Lord's will without knowing doctrine? And it just seemed like, you know, this doesn't make any sense. But since then, I've got a little different understanding. That word will <clears throat> can mean different things. And of course, the translators are translating from uh, 400 plus years ago. And the English language has, has morphed and changed just a little since then. So we think about if any man, you and I have a will. When we talk about exercising our will, that is exercising our determination. We make a determination, we make a choice, and we create a path that we're going to go down. And we still use that. You know, some, a strong-willed child is determined to take his own path. He makes determinations, and he is set against anyone changing those. That's what's in mind here with the first use of this word, will. If any man, so let me, let me rephrase this. If any man wills, or in old English, the word would be willeth. If any man sets his will, his determination, to do the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine. That's the key. You and I need to make the determination that we're not going to inject what we want. We're not going to inject what's most comfortable into our belief system. We're going to make the determination to do God's will. He that will do God's will, he that willeth, he that determines to do God's will, will know the doctrine. Because you're going to the Scripture then with as an open mind as you can in order to let it inform you. That's a safe place to be. And that's where we should, we should all strive to be. To actively seek the Lord's will from Scripture. Now, that's, that's an important side note even of itself. There are so many people today that are caught up in seeking the Lord's will for their life. And I remember hearing a, um, a pastor teach one time that going through Bible study, one of their key assignments one year was to write an essay on the Lord's will for their life. And he, he said all of us as students struggled with that. He said that was, that was the, the professor there did that because he knew that all the students struggled with it. Trying to find the Lord's will for their life. 
And you know, that's something that a lot of people continue to struggle with today. But I remember, I don't know if it's been a year or two ago, Mark did an excellent teaching on understanding the will of God. While so many people are busy looking at God's will out here and over here and, and what I've got in life in front of me and, and all these places in the world and my involvement with the world and they fail to go to the Word of God to seek God's will. This is God's will. And when you understand it dispensationally, we know, know that we live in the dispensation of grace. We go to the, the epistles of Paul specifically to find out what God is doing so that we can join in with what God is doing and participate in that. We know what our eternal purpose is, where our destiny is. We know who Christ is, what He has accomplished for us, how He is dealing with us today. We are equipped to do the will of God. See, the will of God is not that you work at... Uh, the, the store downtown or go work on a hog farm. And that's what people get caught up in. The will of God is that you bring honor and glory to Him and honesty and integrity to the job. If you can do that on the hog farm, great. If you can do that in a hardware store, great. If you can do it on the construction job, great. But if you can't, because some places too... Um, uh, it compromises your integrity, then it would not be the will of God that you be employed at that place. See, the will of God is what's going on inside you. And how you want that to play out in the externals is up to you. We're, God is dealing with us as an adult, adult sons and daughters, not as children under the law. He is equipping you with the knowledge so that you can make wise decisions, so that you can initiate things that would bring honor and glory to Him. That's just a, a little bit about the will of God. But we want to go to the Scriptures to know the truth. And that will guard us <clears throat> against opposition and these false doctrines and the false concepts, the false Jesus that we're being bombarded with in the world around us. <clears throat> so now, what about our boldness? So we know we still face opposition today, and it comes in various different forms. It may not be in the same heavy-handed persecution as the apostles, but by the way, that may not be too far away. You know, as we think about what's taking place in the United States and the hatred that we see among political leaders for Christianity. And, and Judy just reminded me of this this morning, about some of the laws that even right now, currently, they're trying to pass. It will not be favorable for Christianity. At least, biblical Christianity. Because, see, some of the leaders who are passing these things are actually, they consider themselves Christians. But they hate God. You can tell by the way they, they, they talk about a biblical worldview that they hate God. And so that opposition is there, and that persecution for us uh, may not be as far away. Now, I don't know. Things can always turn around, and, and, and we, we've had it pretty easy here in America for the last several hundred years. And it could, it could get better, but it may not be too far away that we could be facing some of that persecution as well. So how do we have boldness? Well, first of all, we pray for it. If you look in Acts chapter 4, there is the, uh, what I would say, misconception that here in the book of Acts, this outpouring of the Holy Ghost, they were supernaturally empowered and, you know, they were overcome with the Holy Spirit and everything was just easy street for him. Kind of like Jesus. You know, it's almost like they're God. And so the persecution is really not, it doesn't phase them. It, it's no big deal. I think it was a big deal. The Holy Spirit indwelling, even though they had supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit indwells you and I. And in both cases, it does not change our free will. The, the only difference is, 
maybe I shouldn't say the only difference, but the key difference is they were given supernatural gifts so that they could heal people where we are not. And they were given supernatural knowledge of the Word of God and we are not. They did not have the completed Word of God. They had some of the Scriptures, but this whole Bible had not been written. As the apostles are teaching here, they only have the Old Testament. So that Holy Spirit is bringing them into a further knowledge and even, in fact, equipping some of them to write more Scripture. So it's bringing a knowledge to their heads, but it doesn't override their free will. They still have to deal with the fears and the anxieties and the turmoil and the pain and the emotions that you and I face today. So that persecution was not easy for them. And so look in verse... Uh, Verse 25, 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 24. This is just after they'd been, been let go. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Now this is all the disciples that are gathered together and said, Lord, thou art God which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So what do they do? First thing is they, they magnify God. They face persecution. They magnify God. Who by the mouth of his servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? And the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And so he quotes David in Psalm chapter 2. Or they do. Because they acknowledge persecution against God has been prophesied. It's to be expected. It's nothing new. Verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast sent, thou, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So God had foretold in Psalm chapter 2 that the nations, not just Israel, Israel and the nations, Jews and Gentiles, kings and people, rulers, would all unite against the Lord's anointed, which was Christ. Verse 29, And now, Lord... Behold their threatenings. So this is a prayer here of all these disciples. It says, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed... The place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. The first thing they did when they were persecuted was they prayed. And so the same thing should be our response as well. And the Apostle Paul even, that was his response. If we look at Ephesians chapter 6, as he dealt with heavy opposition at times, Ephesians 6, 18. And he just got done talking about spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God. And he says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so we know that the Apostle Paul was commissioned with a special message, the gospel of the grace of God. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he had supernatural power. But yet he is still struggling in the inner man just like you and I would. And he's asking the Ephesians to pray for him that he might continue to be bold. Because that's, we need prayer to be bold. And then the second point that we can learn to have boldness is to know the truth. Learn the truth. Know what you believe. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to see Paul dealing with Timothy. And I think this is so pertinent for us today. Because you see, one of the keys for Peter and John and the other apostles to have boldness in the, in the early part of the book of Acts was that the Holy Spirit did bring them knowledge. So they knew. When the leaders were opposing them, they knew the truth. They were unwavering in the truth. 
because they knew. Now, they knew a lot of that supernaturally. You and I must know it from study and from reading the Word of God. It doesn't come into our mind supernaturally. It comes as we take in the Word of God and absorb it and incorporate it in the inner man. And now, here in 2 Timothy, Paul is, is in the latter stages of his ministry. He is being persecuted, and now... A lot of his churches in Asia and his followers are starting to oppose him. They're turning on him because they have been deceived by these false teachers preaching a false Jesus. And so they, some of them have bought into that to where they are opposing him and he is instructing Timothy to be strong. Don't be afraid. Verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. So he's saying, don't be fearful, Timothy. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and of a sound mind. Those things are important to be bold and to grow in our knowledge of the Scripture. And he says, Be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Be willing to suffer shame for his name. Verse 9, Who hath called us, or who hath saved us. So the, Timothy knows all this. Paul is not teaching Timothy new things right here in this letter. But in, in light of Timothy being timid and starting to recoil at the opposition, Paul writes him this letter, acknowledges the opposition is real, the persecution is real, expect it, but here's what you need to focus on. Don't lose sight of this. So Paul is going to give him a summary to keep in the core and the foundation of his understanding who hath saved us and called us with unholy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel." Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. So in other words, Paul's saying there is this holy calling. It is a set-apart calling giving to the, the body of Christ in this dispensation of grace. It's a message that was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And remember, we've dealt with that. Paul talks about his message being hid in God since the foundation of the world. Whereas Peter talked about in Acts chapter 3 that he was teaching Israel everything according to what had been prophesied and been foretold since the world began. So what has been foretold since the world began cannot be the same information as what has been kept secret since the foundation of the world. So Paul brings that up again. He says, Timothy, don't lose sight of that. And he says, verse 11, whereunto, that's that message, this dispensation of grace, the apostle of the Gentiles, is whereof I am appointed, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. In other words, Timothy, don't lose sight of where you got your message. You can't go back and put people under the law because that's not according to the message given us through the apostle Paul. You can't go back and, and put people under the feast days or those holy days or, or things of Israel's program. You can't tell people in this dispensation that they're going to go through the tribulation and enter and, set, and live in a, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. That's not our program. Our message was what was hid in Christ since the world began. Verse 12, For which cause I also suffer these things? And Paul's saying, I, I suffer for this message. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, I know, I know whom I have believed. 
and am persuaded, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So to have boldness today, there are things that we need to know and we need to believe and we need to be persuaded. And it comes from the Word of God and studying the Word of God. <clears throat> so in closing, I just ask you the question, are you willing to suffer shame for His name? And maybe you have, but maybe it's going to be more intense in the years ahead. Are you willing to suffer shame for His name? And if you do suffer, and I'm not talking about suffering uh, with illness of cancer or suffering from uh, a lifelong condition. I'm not talking about suffering of a, a wound or an injury. I'm talking about suffering for the name of Christ. If you do suffer for Christ, if we do, can we rejoice like the apostles did? Can we rejoice to suffer shame for His name? Because if you do, the Bible speaks of great reward in eternity. So it may be hard now, but we need to have eternal perspective. It definitely will be worth it. So with that, we'll close. If there's any comment or question, <clears throat> feel free. Um, I'll just say I like the <clears throat> fact that you brought out this, this shame, um, shame for his name. It's something I've probably read over many times never jumped out at me, um, thankfully like it did for you, um, and that you brought it up to us because it is something that, you know, the, the apostles went through serious persecutions. Um, it's definitely evident in what we read in Scripture and what was even historically recorded later on in, in different um, ways. You, you can go back and read just how badly they did suffer, and yet they continued on with what was their purpose and their, their role and their... Um, God's will for them and yet as you've instructed us here and told us you know we are to have that same boldness to go through the persecutions and later in that second book of Timothy it tells that we will suffer persecution I think it's chapter 3 it says right Christians will suffer yeah. persecution it's not that it may or may not happen we will yeah if we stand for his name and if we stand mm -hmm. for his 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 will um, but you brought up another point that um, that they were supernaturally given that information. They were told, uh, I think it's back in Matthew 10, they said that you will go before councils and you will be brought before kings and judges and you will stand basically and suffer persecution, but don't, don't fear because you will be given the information. Right. That's right. But the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. Yeah. Don't worry about it. We're not given that instruction. Yeah. We are told we have to learn the Word of God to be able to be prepared to yep. give the, the statement and the testimony that we're to have. Um, and I can remember somebody once saying that they, they had been given the information, you know, they felt like they were put in a, per, in a, in a situation where they were able to um, speak because the Holy Spirit gave them that, that information. And I thought, you know, that's, that's them taking something that was given to the apostles and that truth and that um, something that really happened for them and trying to apply it to themselves and say I don't need to learn the word of God because when something comes up it's going to be given to me yeah. and if people live their life that way and think that way they're going to be ill equipped and they're going to suffer shame in a sense because yeah. the Holy Spirit's not just going to give that to them supernaturally Right. they have to be prepared and, and ready we have to be prepared and ready Yep. or when we suffer that persecution that again will come yep yeah thank you and and that is a a great reminder that i mean even as we think of third world countries and, and different countries that don't readily have the word of god available they can still suffer for the uh, shame for his name and be rewarded by standing true to that but it still doesn't lessen the fact that what they what they're suffering for 
they will only be rewarded for what is true to standing for what is true according to scripture if someone comes along and is persecuted for the name of Jesus because they're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness when they've denied the deity of Christ that has no reward they're not a saved individual when someone understands the gospel um, they will be judged based on holding to that truth and they will be rewarded for suffering shame for his name and so for us today we have no excuse it's not like some some uh, countries where they might only have one book of the Bible or they might be relying on someone to read scripture to them because they don't have a Bible of their own we have the Word of God and much of America has the Word of God and so as we are bombarded with all this diverse stuff it's so important for us to dig into it to know the Lord's will <clears throat> Thank you for that. Anybody else? If not, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time of fellowship together. We're thankful that uh, we can enjoy your word and learn from it. And even as we study Israel's program, there are so many things that we can learn. And, and while they have a direct application to Israel, there's many things that we can apply spiritually to our own lives as well. And so, Father, help us to have that discernment and and the wisdom to do so. And Father, we are thankful that we can rest in the finished work of the cross and that we can know that and believe it and be persuaded of it. And I pray that each one of us here in this room would be that way and that we would never waver from that commitment to who Christ is and what He has accomplished. And yet, Father, even beyond that, we do pray that we might grow in our understanding of, of your will and the doctrines and, and, and everything entailed in the scriptures. We pray that we might continue to grow. And the more we know, the more we can stand firm in the face of opposition. So we pray that you would help us to this end. Father, help us each one as we uh, go forth here this coming week that we would be prepared uh, to give an answer according to grace to anyone who is seeking and, and give us uh, words that would be fitting in the right situations to direct people to Christ. And it's in His name and for His glory we pray. Amen.